<laughs> um, my aim today is to try and put it into where, what you're hoping to do here into a global framework. Because from Totnes to Totnerdon, people are doing something like this throughout the country and throughout the world. And it is absolutely vital that you're doing that. What I hope to be able to do is show you why it is so important. But what, one of the most interesting things about this movement, which I think you should be able to talk about, is that there's a mixture of people, there's the thinkers and there's the doers. And there's a dialogue between them. But what I would like to just ask you, I would like to get a quick picture of what we have here. Are you thinkers or are you doers? You can be both. I think I'm using the microphone, isn't it? Is it all oh, right? Is it working? It's not, is it? Right. So, could you put your hands up if you think you're a thinker, and then if you're a doer? So, thinkers, will you put your hands up, please? Do it. Both. No, I think you're mine. You're like that. Okay, so it's supposed to be evenly balanced, yes. How do I move that? Right, okay, so we've done that. Right, so we've got a nice balance. First though, let's start with what is sustainable food. I call it, say, it's food which is healthier for people and the planet. I noticed Chris kept saying, it's not, it's not about the health issue. It is, but there's not, a, there's not a battle going on here. Luckily, healthy food is also sustainable food, on the whole. There's a few differences. Um, but one measure of the food we have in this country is to measure it in terms of environmental impacts. And that, that can be measured by something called an ecological footprint. And that is a measure of the amount of land we need to grow the food, to catch the pollution, and to produce the energy in order to make the food. If we add those three up, we take up five times the area of Britain to feed ourselves. Clearly this is selfish and it can't go on. But the good news is, the ways to reduce that footprint, the biggest way to reduce it is to eat healthily, the five a day diet. That reduces that impact by about 20 plus percent. If you make it local as well, you're adding another 10 percent into the equation. So a third of the footprint can be reduced simply by eating proper food locally. If you go fully vegan, it's another 5% and organic, further 2%. Sustainable food also has social aspects as well, but I'll come on to that in a moment. But what I want to just veer off before coming back to sustainable food is that in the last two or three years, the word sustainable food has been overtaken by food security. You'll hear it, people say we have a population of 9 billion by the year 2050. And we haven't got the land and all this sort of stuff. Um, and politicians <coughs> are focusing more on food because of this aspect of food security. But when they talk about food security, they're really talking about and worried about food price rises. Since 2008, food prices have been rising all the time. The DEFRA stats, I think, were there. Oh, by the way, don't worry about any of the stats or anything. Just go to sustainablefood.com. That's my website. You'll find all these stats in there easily. Um, the, different, the stats we just out are saying that in the last 25 years, food prices have gone up 25%. And I'm sure most of you have noticed that. And it's not stopping. And the reason it's not stopping is we're so dependent on food from abroad that we are dependent on what goes on in the world markets. More of that in a minute. Um, the stats from DEFRA last year also show that poorer people are eating less fruit and veg than a year ago. And that again is back, that's the classic situation in the recession, people turn to comfort foods rather than better foods. Now what does that do? <laughs> <laughs> Helps me. Oh, okay. <coughs> right. So, um, the, the point is, in those food prices, the food price rises in Germany and France are not going up anywhere near as much as they are here because they're not so dependent on the world markets. 
And just to give you an idea of how much we're dependent on world markets, we now import 15 billion, not million, billion pounds worth of food which we could grow ourselves. That's not the coffee, the bananas and the tea stuff, although we can grow those as well. That's the, that's the mange twos from Kenya, that's the lettuces coming in from New Zealand. So we rely on the land and labour of our old empire much more than any of the other European countries. We're much more um, susceptible. And those high food prices you know, have impacted countries elsewhere. The, the Egyptian uprising started, and Tunisia, the, the, veget the vegetable grower that killed himself, that set it all off, was all about higher food prices because they were more dependent on the world markets. So you, you, you can't help but think, certainly our security systems, you know, the defence systems are now concerned about these food price rises because of the impact they'll have in this country. <coughs> Part of those food price rises are they being caused by speculation, the amount of which is very hard to calculate. But certainly, the bankers are piling into the commodities, the food commodity trade, as other aspects of the financial system collapse. They can make money out of food. And it, just a, about three months ago, there was a G20 summit where Sarkozy actually said the world <coughs> finance system has got to put a stop to this speculation in food. We've got to control it. But uh, Call Me Dave, you know, went there and said, no, you're, you're going to affect our finance sector. You can't have that. You know, so ditch that. So we, there's not going to be controls on the world markets over it. Um, but as I say, the, the real worry of the, those food prices is partly because we're so used to paying for cheap food. We, we, we have a god of cheap food. And so that's hitting us harder, certainly psychologically. Just to emphasize that this country has been the founder of cheap food ever since the um, repeal of the Corn Laws over 150 years ago, where the industrialists you know, wanted to pay the workers cheaper they, with wheat from uh, Canada and wherever. And we've gone on and on like that, and it's got worse over the last 20 years as more and more women have entered the, the, mar uh, the um, going out to work. We've wanted more cheaper and cheaper food to, for them to do that. So we will find it very difficult to move from that debate that you're having in procurement. Um, we will have great difficulty moving to an idea that best value isn't, doesn't mean the cheapest food. It means a lot more than cheap crap, which is what we're used to. And just to emphasise how this is going to get worse and how the use of land is going to be more and more important in the future is I was over in China a few months ago and I was out, I was out for an afternoon in the countryside and I couldn't believe the state of the countryside there. There was vines, you know, bindweed growing over these, what I thought were going to be very well-tended plots. And what's happening there is that 150 million people are migrating inside China from the country into the towns. That, that 150 million people less to look after the land. And yet they will still want, the Chinese government will still want cheap food because it's going to pay the workers as little as possible. They are already, all over the world, pulling more and more food into China. They're building the biggest port in the world just outside Rio de Janeiro. So, um, and, and they're sort of taking lamb from New Zealand and hence our lamb prices are going up, you've probably noticed. That's the first signs of China's role in the world. But basically, um, you know, China, I can predict China will get fat within about 10 years. You know, because they'd be eating cheap crap soon. And there will be more demand for the land we have taken for granted in Africa and South America. So, when, when turning towards how to get cheap food, I really wanted to get this in, because uh, the last time food prices went up was in the mid-70s in America. <coughs> and Richard Nixon told his Secretary of State, Earl Butts, to go out and sort that one out. What he did was, instead of having plans to limit the amount of food produced, because the, the problem is always overproducing food, it's not to produce enough food, we have a problem of overproduction, especially in America. What this guy did, he said, no, plant from fence to fence, row to row, and we will then dump that food on the rest of the world. He did deals with Russia to get rid of the food, 
And the other thing you did was to create something called uh, high fructose corn syrup, which is the crap which is now in all the Coca-Cola and the lemonade in the world. And if one person is if one single person is responsible for globesity, it's Earl Putz. But I would invite you to go and find out why he resigned. It's a fascinating story. In 20 years before political correctness was invented, he had to resign. It's so devastating. I'm not going to say what he said, but if you get your wiki out and go and have a look, it's a fabulous little story. The other, th the other aspect of it is, so, we, so we've got a, a problem. We can't rely on the empire in the future. We can't rely on lots of food coming into the country. Um, and despite all the talk about food security, we only, we only produce about 1% to 2% of the whole world's food. But in the last 20, 25 years, we, our contribution to the world for grain has declined by about a third, for meat has declined by about half, and for fruit and vegetables, two thirds. Again, an amazing indictment when we're supposed to be more concerned about producing more food. And for me, as uh, the introduction said, this is incredible indictment for, for where I come from. Um, <coughs> because uh, I was educated at Newcastle University in agricultural science. I think I was the first year when it wasn't Durham. You know, it was King's College Durham, wasn't it, until, until I turned up. Um, the first degree in agricultural science. But uh, just last year, the vegetable research station at Wellsbourne was closed down for one to two million pounds. Meanwhile, our overseas department has just put 80 million pounds into international agricultural centres around the world. Yet we haven't, we haven't, we've lost our vegetable research station. We've also lost, in the process, um, the next college I went to, by college, London University, probably the best university agriculture college in the world at that time. Liz was there. Liz was there about, I think, about a month after I left. I'm trying, I was trying to work it out. Um, and, and Reading last year closed down the horticultural degree. Um, the main agricultural university departments have gone. It's, Newcastle's still there, but it's not science. There was floor after floor of science. It's all gone. The, the research stations which were around at that time, 18 out of 20 of them have gone. Plant Breeding Institute, Class Asrisus, my favourite, the Hop Research Centre, has gone. I, when I finished, I then went to the advisory service, which was a free system where you went around the country advising farmers what to grow, giving them advice on, on the best techniques. It was free. Gone. It's a tenth of a size, it's commercial. So we haven't got the infrastructure that we had even 20 or 30 years ago to work out how we produce our food. So the crunch is coming, and where do we go? And one of the responses from the science side, from the government <coughs> foresight, uh, foresight, saga, foresight report, I know where I got that from, um, the foresight report, John Benjamin, chief scientist, talk about a perfect storm coming. They talk about it in terms of the oil is running out. The prices will go up. That, you know, the water, there's going to be battles about water. I think there's going to be a big battle in Britain this, this next year on water, about <coughs> drought. And, you know, we on the west side, we're just driving over with the west side. It was nice and cloudy and damp. As soon as we got over the top of the Pennines, sun, flat, and dry. You know, I think there's going to be an east west battle this next year. So, water is important. We're running out of phosphates. We're polluting too much in the process. They talk about it as a perfect storm. What, what the scientists then to then say is what we need is sustainable intensification. We've only got a, the, the way they think is we've got a limited amount of land. We've got to produce more food from that land, but we've got to do it more sustainably. In other words, we've got to use less fertilizer, less pesticides, and what have you. One of the answers to that is they would say, well, genetic modification will help that process. I don't have a great problem with GM, by the way. But what I do have a problem with is this notion that there is only a limited amount of land that can be used. As I said, just coming over the hills, I, I kept pointing out, look at that paddock there. That's been puddled by ponies. That, that land's gone to waste. That land should be used for that. And in other words, they are just talking about the good land. They want to get more out of the good land. We've got to think in terms of using the the less good land, the poorer land, the, the harder to work land. And that will require money and intensification and more, more investment. 
<coughs> so uh, the problem with that is that sustainable intensification has been seen as the only way forward. It is clearly, you can't say it's silly to not to try and produce more with less inputs, but clearly as the only way, it's, it isn't going to provide enough. And the other aspect of sustainable um, food, which tends not to get mentioned, is what about the workers? What happens if a quarter of a million people from Eastern Europe don't want to come here and work for sh shit wages in crap conditions, pardon my organic language, but you know, all they're going to do is stop. And where do we go there? We haven't got the skills base, we haven't got the college base, we, work, we wouldn't know what to do. And also, the mentality of getting young people out into the fields and working is a massive barrier as well, which we haven't begun to consider. So, only a third of our workers are now permanent. They've just done away with the Agricultural Wages Board, which is where the skill structure, where people were rewarded for the skills, that's been done away with, making it even less enticing to get out onto the land. Luckily, luckily, this fabulous quote from the World Health Organization. Can you read it? Can you see it? Or shall I read it there? Fortunately, the strategies needed to create desire and change the nutrition and environmental patterns are often complementary. That point I was making at the beginning. You know, the health and the environmental aspects are coincidental. They're not contradictory. In addition, local strategies that seek to improve the availability and access to and consumption of locally produced foods, particularly fruit and veg, also increase the interdependence and thus the social cohesion between urban and rural dwellers. You know, that is the mission statement almost <coughs> of what you're trying to do. Bringing together urban and rural and, put, and, and the health of the sustainable aspects. And it's quite simple, as, as Mary will spell out in the next bit. Plant, fruit and vegetables. It's, it's not that complicated. It is quite straightforward. It's quite simple. So, one of the examples is um, we could reclaim our orchards. Um, that's me planting rhubarb and top, which ain't got the same thing. But we've lost our orchards about 15, 20 years ago. The EU is paying. <coughs> I got five minutes. The EU is the EU is paying for farmers to grub up the, the, the orchards. Uh, when I was at Kent, there was orchards everywhere. It's sheep now. You know, Chorley, where, where I live near, was the orchard for Manchester. You wouldn't know it now. There's not a, one in sight. Eccleston for Wigan, what have you. You know, we can grow these things and we can supply the cities from nearby. So here, here's a chance. Oh, by the way, this, I'm just signalling up to anybody who's interested. The Science Research Council has just announced £7 million for fruit and vegetable growing, which is good, well done, you know. But again, the, the thinking will be to produce more of the main varieties rather than what we want is a, to create a whole new diversity of fruit. And I would like to think of the idea of being able to grow pineapples in Preston and grapefruit in Glasgow. Why not? We can do it. And what I was saying just earlier on, that ways of seeing, we need to, we need to teach people to, how to look at the land and see what you could do with the land. That's just one picture, but that is of, of a farmhouse that was above our farm in, the, um, in Slaburn in uh, Truffle you know, I don't know, half a mile, we were right on, our farm was right on the fells. But that farmhouse there was clearly inhabited a hundred and odd years ago. And it farmed. And yet nowadays, it's just there for the grouse. And the amount the, the common market pay for grouse shooting is unbelievable. But they, they pay bugger all for fruit and veg. But we've got to tackle that ourselves. So, I've just got four points to finish off on of what you, in the process of developing your local food plan, I think there's four things to have a, keep an eye on. One is the skills aspect of it. I mentioned the skills have all gone, but people are digging now, people are starting to learn how to grow again. I think we should have it in the curriculum and we should have it as qualifications, vocational qualifications. If anybody is interested in that, please talk to me. I work <coughs> up with the Todmorden Incredibles, where we're working with the school and apprenticeships. So we can feed in together on that. And I'm, I'm in a good place with Lantra to try and develop those quals. The community. 
There's a woman called Jenny Griggs who's watch out for a book coming out called Market Gardens 2030. I, I was hoping to get a, a link to it, but she <coughs> suggests why not have a voucher system in some areas where if you have an outside body funding a system, why don't you get them to fund vouchers which you take round to the poorer houses, explain to people what it's about, and they can then go and retrieve them in terms of locally grown fruit and veg. That way you involve a lot more people, and I can see the volunteers who go around have to be educated to explain that, you know, and it, it creates a driver then. <coughs> The one thing I'm particularly concerned about with all these different approach, all these different initiatives going on in the country is nobody is checking for the bugs and the diseases which are being produced, which I can guarantee you will follow like night and day. <coughs> we need a proper coordinated system in order to, to give advice <coughs> and to collect the research and evidence on what inevitably is going to turn up. And that's just my, my final point is so, somebody needs to coordinate all these different local initiatives. And next week there is a conference <coughs> called Making Local Food Future in London, isn't there, which will be doing that. But again, I think you should try and allocate somebody to coordinate, because it's, I, I don't think they should be controlled by the various initiatives. It doesn't want top level control, but it will need coordination because there's going to be general problems emerging and I don't quite know how that's going to be shared. But I, I wish you all the best here and also I pledge that if you want any help or support I will be here to provide that. So thank you.